Right. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Well, we're back in the book of Luke. In Luke chapter 7, verses 18 to 50. So we have a lot of verses to cover, but uh, I, I will do my best to be succinct. How's everybody doing? Good. We got a couple of first time visitors who will be shocked to be here today. Glad that you're here. We won't embarrass you by bringing you up front. Hi, that. Okay, now I know. Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you guys here. As we get into the word, I, I always, I always try to pick the worship songs that are going to kind of point us to the message, and it's a real message of humility uh, that we're going to see here. That kind of goes throughout the two stories that we're going to talk about here in Luke, in Luke chapter seven. We've got John the Baptist who is in prison and hearing about Jesus is wondering if he's really who he thought he was. Something that we all might go through, doubts. And then there's a woman that comes and puts herself at Jesus' feet and cries in a Pharisee's house. And so we're going to look at these two events and hopefully you're going to uh, have the Lord speak to your heart this morning because we tend to fall into all of these categories, and I think it's important for us to go through. But before we get started, please pray with me. <sighs> Father, you are holy, and there is none beside you. We pray that your spirit would unlock our minds and our hearts from all the things that would hold us captive to not hear your voice this morning. And Lord, we just want to give you permission to come and rebuild us. Because when we build on our own, Lord, we don't do things according to the specs. And the things that we do just don't last unless you're in it. And then they last forever. So Lord, I pray that you help us in our minds and our hearts that we might hear from you today as we look into your word, that which will endure forever, your word. Pray that you might engraft it into our hearts, that it might become part of who we are, not just a volume of knowledge. So, Lord, we're here. Pray that you work. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the verse for today is in Luke chapter 7, verse 20. And when the men had come to him and said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, are you the coming one or do we look for another? It's an interesting thing that we get involved in when we doubt. I don't know if any of you have ever doubted your relationship with the Lord, doubted that what God's word says is true. And it's easy to believe that it's true for everybody else. It's just so hard for us to believe it's true for us. You know, that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It's, it's easy for me to say that to you, that it's available to you. It's difficult for me to understand that God did it for me too. And maybe you have that same struggle. And so sometimes we doubt. And doubt is a little different than unbelief. Unbelief is a willful choice. Doubt means that you're confused. You're not thoroughly convinced. And so when the man said... I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. He really means help my doubt. That's the, help my questioning. Help that part of me that's holding back from not giving you everything and trusting you totally. So as we look at the scriptures, I hope that the Lord will speak to you as uh, the Lord has spoken to me as I've been going through this. Last week, we saw Jesus dealing with a centurion's servant. The centurion said, I, I, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but I'm a man who's under authority. If you, if you say go... The, this thing will go. If you say come, it'll come. And you know, you say do this, it'll do it. And he says, I understand what you're about because you're under authority, just like I'm under authority. And so we talked about that last week about being under God's authority and having authority because we're under authority. And Jesus had authority because he was under the authority of his father. He says that I do nothing of my own, but only as I see the father do. And so we learned something about, of that. And Jesus was amazed at his faith 
and this is a centurion, a, a Roman guard who's in charge of 100 men. And these were the enemies of Israel. And Jesus was willing to go and to heal his servant, which is an amazing heart for someone to have, for someone who in the Roman world was a disposable commodity as a servant. And then we looked at the widow of Nain's son who had died a widow, her only son, died, and they were carrying him out of the city as Jesus and this giant crowd showed up wanting to get into the city. They walked right into a funeral procession, and Jesus walks over to the dead body with an open casket and puts his hand on the dead body, which you don't do. A good Jew doesn't touch dead things or dead people, or you become unclean, and you have to quarantine before soap and water and masks and all that. And he tells the widow, don't weep, which seems cruel until he says, young man, rise. And he sits up, much to the shock of the pallbearers, I'll bet. And he presents him back to his mother, which is an amazing thing. And Jesus raises the dead. He does that three times in his ministry that we know about and that are written of. And so Jesus still raises the dead. And so it's not so hard for me to believe that he rose from the dead Amen. because he could raise the dead and he said he would. So I believe that. So we looked at that last week. This week, we're going to look at two stories, one of John in prison. And then the disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things, concerning all the things I just talked about, that all the ministry that Jesus was doing. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent to Jesus saying, are you the coming one or do we look for another? When the men had come to him, he said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Well, that's good. They reported the message exactly. John the Baptist has been in prison for about 10 months. And you know what he did. You know the story of John the Baptist. He knew about Jesus before he was born. He leapt in his mother Elizabeth's womb as Jesus approached in utero with Mary. So why is it so hard to understand that Jesus is the one who he said? He's the one who looked over and saw Jesus and he said, behold, the Lamb of God. And a couple of John's disciples ended up following Jesus from that point on. I believe one of them was John the Apostle. And so what's, what's he doubting for? In Luke 3, 19 to 20, we see the incident where it put him in prison. But Herod the Tetrarch being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and all the evils which Herod had done, also added this, above all, he shut John up in prison because he had the guts to go up to a leader and say, you're sleeping with your brother's wife and that ain't right. That's called adultery and, and a bunch of weirdness too. <laughs> Take your brother's wife and faced off with him. But he was afraid to do anything with John because of the crowds. He didn't want a rebellion. He wanted to keep the peace at all costs, except his then girlfriend that he was sleeping with his in-law slash girlfriend. It's weird when you get, it's a funny family tree. Probably encouraged him and said, what are you, what are you sitting around for? And had him put in prison. So he's got a year of ministry where he's preaching repentance by the Jordan and baptizing people into repentance and telling them to turn that the Messiah is coming and they should get ready. And so he knows who Jesus is. And right now he's in this place here. This is the fortress Macarius, which was the king's palace. And he was in the dungeon down underneath. This is the remnants of it. And you can find it online. YouTube is such a wonderful thing because you can go places. It's like books. In Luke 4, 18 and 19, Jesus said this concerning what his job was, what he was here to do. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Well, I guess that would qualify John the Baptist, right? Because he's a captive. 
and recovery of sight to the blind and set at liberty those who are oppressed. I'll bet John would say, I'm feeling pretty oppressed. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he said this as he was reading in Nazareth, if you remember as we went through that. And so here's John, the outdoorsman, the guy who wore camel's hair and a leather belt and he looked like a prophet and he spoke like a prophet and he didn't own a hairbrush. And, you know, he was a wild man and he ate locusts dipped in honey. So he was definitely not a carb eater. So he's, he's an extremist, right? And he yells and screams when he preaches. Don't you wish he was here today? <laughs> Wouldn't need the mic. And he tells people, and he faces off with people. He wasn't afraid to tell people exactly where they were. Now, he's basically entombed in prison for 10 months. Stone walls, iron gates. He's not outside anymore. Remember, he lived outside in the wilderness. He was a wild man. He enjoyed the outdoors, the open sky. And here he is inside a prison. And he hears about everything that Jesus is doing and he says, are you the guy? Are you the one that I thought you were? Or are we looking for somebody else? If somebody told me that, I would feel a little intimidated. Are you the pastor? Or am I looking for somebody else? Because looking at you, I, you know. I just find that amazing that John the Baptist, the one who knew who Jesus was before anybody else, who was introduced to Jesus before anybody else, who grew up, he was his cousin, and he says, there he is, the Lamb of God, who came to him to be baptized, and he says, I, I, I'm, I'm in need to be baptized by you. Why should I baptize you? You should be baptizing me. And he goes, everything must be done according to the law, so he does it. John knows who Jesus is, but he's beginning to doubt because he's in a dark place and he's wondering, where is my savior? When is this all going to be ending? And he goes around and he seems to have time for everyone else, healing and healing and teaching and rebuking and raising the dead. And here I am in prison. When are you going to get to me? Do you feel that? That's where he is. And it's interesting. It's, it's in those dark times that we, we begin to doubt the things that God's shown us in the light, we begin to doubt in the dark. When we don't see God's redemption, we don't get our expectations fulfilled. It's the most dangerous thing, unmet expectations. Um, my wife was expecting me home for dinner at five and I didn't come till eight. It's a very dangerous thing. <laughs> when someone has an expectation that's unmet and that's the makings of depression and anger and murder and all sorts of other things. So what is the difference between doubt and unbelief? Unbelief is a choice. I will not believe. It's what Thomas said. Thomas is called the doubter. He's actually the unbeliever. He says, I will not believe unless I stick my finger in the holes in his hands and I thrust my arm into the hole in his side. And Jesus showed up a week later. Poof. He said, peace be with you. It's good. I th he didn't say boo. Peace be with you. And then he goes to Thomas, who is seeing him for the first time post-resurrection, and he goes, Thomas, come over here. Put your finger in the holes in my hands. And he offers them, I'm sure. And thrust your arm into the hole in my side and believe. You see, that's a willful decision to believe or unbelieve, and that's why there's judgment as we stand before God. Because it's not, I didn't have enough information. It's you chose to not believe. Unbelief is a choice. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Most people, you talk about faith and they say, oh yeah, that magical, ethereal, sort of non-substantial belief in something you have absolutely no proof of. That's not what faith is. You're all exercising faith by sitting and putting your full weight in a chair. That's faith. And you came in and you didn't even question. You sat down because you know it to be true. We check these chairs. And you've sat in them before and they've held you. It's no different than putting faith in the Lord because 
we have learned that he is the one who can support us. He's the one who can hold us. He's the one who can lead us. And that's the kind of faith that we exercise. Faith that is reasonable. And it is substance. It is evidence. It's not just an ethereal, I hope so. Verse 21. And that very hour, he cured many infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and many blind, he gave sight. So the disciples of John come and say, are you the one? Or are we looking for somebody else? And he goes, just one minute. And then he comes back to have a conversation. Are you the one or should we look for someone else? And Jesus starts healing the blind and casting out evil spirits and healing everyone who needed to be healed. Jesus gave them visible evidence of who he was. He didn't try to defend himself. He didn't use words. He didn't feel intimidated like I might. He gave evidence. Am I the one? Here, give me just one minute. <laughs> and then he does all of these miraculous things. And he says, go tell John the things that you've seen and heard. And that the blind see, that the lame walk, that the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. He's talking about John. Blessed are you, John, if you don't lose the faith and if you're not offended by me. Actually, the, the word offended is the word where we get the word scandalized from. It's actually the bait stick inside of a cage that you might lure an animal into. And when he gets into it, he's trapped. So that's the word scand where we get the word scandalize. It's this bait to get you into a trap. And he says, don't get trapped, John. Don't get lured into this trap of doubting because that's a deep rabbit hole, isn't it? You begin to doubt and you begin to ask questions. And then, of course, because you're looking for it, you find all sorts of evidence that says, no, God doesn't love me. How could he? And yet he does. So he says, blessed are you if you're not offended because of me. And Jesus does this in the midst of all of these needs that he's taking care of. But see, John has an unmet expectation. If Jesus can help all of them, how come he hasn't come and rescued me? How come I'm here in prison and I can't be out in open sky, out by the Jordan, baptizing people anymore? Because Jesus has a better plan for John and he doesn't realize it. And so Jesus says, go back and tell him what you see. When the messengers of John had departed, he began to speak to the multitudes concerning John. He says, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind. But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who are gorgeously apparelled and live in luxury are in king's courts. It's like, did you go, did you go to see some fashion trend setting dude out in the desert? Is that what you wanted to see? Did you think that there was a, you know, there was a fashion show out there? Because if you went to see that, you were sorely disappointed because John's clothes were made of camel hair. I don't know if you've ever felt camel hair, but it is nothing like a dog that you might have or a cat. It's rough. And he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. He was a radical, radical dude. There was nobody could say that he was stuck on his lazy boy. You know, that the TV had mastery over him. And he begins to praise John publicly. After speaking to these guys and giving him a stern review, you know, blessed are you if you're not stumbled or scandalized, pulled into this trap because of me, you'll be blessed. And then he begins to speak to the crowds as these guys are walking away. He then begins to praise John because it's always good to praise somebody in public, right? You don't want to rebuke them in public. You want to rebuke in private and you want to praise public, right? We tend to do the other thing. Take somebody aside and say, listen, you've been doing a real good job. I appreciate you. I just want to let you know. Then you walk away and you go, nah, they're not that great. And this is the world. This, the world does everything opposite, don't they? It's opposite world. 
And so he praises him publicly and he reproves him in private. And here's my best picture of John, just this wild guy out in the wilderness. And he lives there. He doesn't commute home to a nice city apartment. I mean, this is where he lives, out in the, out in the, the wilderness. So did you go to see somebody like this, perhaps? Somebody who's all coiffed, you know, with multiple piercings and tattoos and decorated in the finest of linen. Did you go to see somebody who's all dressed up and, and you know, cleaned up? It's funny because the church today ends up going in this direction, doesn't it? Did you go to see somebody that was charismatic in the way that he appeared? Because if you went there to see that, you're, you're going to be very disappointed with John. Hopefully they went there for more substance. But not everybody went there for those reasons. And Jesus says, what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. That's actually Malachi 3.1. This was a prophet who was prophesied of. So he's like a double prophet because he was prophesied about. For I say to you among those born of women that there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Jesus says things like this all the time and you just go. <laughs> Isaiah 40 verse 4 also speaks about the ministry that John would have. And he says, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill made low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. You remember John quoting that was telling people, straighten out your life. The big problems that you have or the serious depressions you have, you need to get that stuff leveled out. And if you've got some crookedness in your life and you've been going astray here and there, you need to straighten it out and get it straight. That's what he's referring to. He's not talking about landscaping. He's talking about getting your heart right before God. And that was one of the passages he quoted in his ministry. And at the end, John says, in John, we see John the Baptist saying, he must increase but I must decrease. You see, he knew his place and he knew that he was the guy to go, ta-da, here's Jesus. And that was it. His ministry was over. He knew that at one point. And he who comes from above is above all. And he who is of earth is earthly. He's speaking of himself and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. He's speaking of Jesus. So he knows who he is and he knows who Jesus is. And he says, his sandals, I'm not even worthy. I'm not even qualified to do the smallest dirty task on taking the, his laces off of his sandals and taking his shoe off. I'm not even up to that par. And yet he's the greatest prophet that ever lived, according to Jesus. And so there's John, who used to be an outdoorsman, who's now locked in between four walls, wondering where Jesus is. Where's his salvation? Where's my miracle? And yet, you know what happens. It's not long after this that Salome dances before him in that, in that palace that I just showed to you. And she connives with her mom to get the head of John the Baptist because her mom's insulted by the insults that John threw at him. And so the king reluctantly does it because of his guests and he shot his mouth off after a sensual dance. He said, I'll give you anything you want up to half my kingdom. And he just made a huge mistake. And that was the end of the ministry of John the Baptist. One year out in the field, almost a year in prison, and then beheaded. And yet, you and I are going to meet him. You and I are going to meet him with his hat on. <laughs> I wonder if he'll be as rough as he once was. And when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors glorified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. See, even the hardest of the hardest sinners, the tax collectors, the turncoats, these who have turned their back on their own people and collected taxes from them for the Romans, these folks were convicted by what he said. And they said, man, I'm messed up. I, I need to turn over a new leaf. I need to give my life to God again. And they were baptized. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. 
We see in Matthew 3, 1, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's interesting, if you're in the book of Mark, that's the first thing Jesus says too, repent. That's a willful decision to turn from your behavior, from the behavior you know that you shouldn't be doing and turning toward God. It's not just turning away, it's turning toward the Lord. And so that was his message. John 5.35 says, Jesus speaking of John says, he was a burning and shining lamp that you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. There are some people when they shoot off their mouth and they're belligerent and they they say difficult things and they're kind of in your face, it's, uh, it's kind of cool for a little while, especially if they're not talking about you until they lower their aim at you. And then suddenly you're with all the other people going. "Ah." I know what that's like. He didn't compromise or cower to celebrity. He was somebody who would put his finger in your face and tell you the truth. And he wasn't afraid to tell the truth. You know, that's like a hard commodity now to find is the truth. Like the real truth, the very well balanced truth. And what's even harder is the truth in love. That only comes from mature people. And it's something that God should be working into our hearts because, well, I don't know about you, but truth is always easier to swallow with with, with love, right? Somebody's telling me because they care about me, I'm much more able to listen to them than just because they had a bad day and they're just mad looking to take it out on somebody. Then I want to say, hey. And he was the one who baptized Jesus. I just think that's an amazing thing. And now he's wondering, are you the one or should we look for somebody else? Was I wrong in announcing to everybody who you were? And yet he had to know something of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He had to know something of the suffering because he said, behold, the lamb of God. We know about lambs and sacrifices. And he said, the lamb of God, that God sent his only son to die for our sins. He had to know. And yet, When you're in a dark time, when it's difficult and your expectations aren't met, you wonder if anything that you believe is real. It's wonderful that the Bible puts this here because we're no different, are we? There are times when we doubt whether God's really at work in our lives, whether he's really working things, all things together for good, for those that love the Lord, for those that are called called according to his purpose. I mean, we, we begin to wonder about, is God's word true for me? Or am I just the exception? (laughs) You know, it applies to everybody else, but not me. Sometimes we think we are. Verse 31, and the Lord said, to what then shall I liken the men of this generation? Because you remember the lawyers and the the Pharisees, they didn't get baptized and they were against John. In fact, it's amazing that the Jews didn't go rescue him because he was one of their own. He was a Levite. He should have been, instead of being a prophet, he should have been a priest. Would have been easy to be a priest. You just go to the book of Deuteronomy and it tells you everything you need to do. But being a prophet, it's kind of wide open. So he says, what shall I like in the men of this generation? And what are they like? Well, they're like children sitting in the marketplace, calling to one another saying, we played the flute to you and you didn't dance. We mourned to you, but you did not weep. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. And you say, he has a demon. The son of man has come eating and drinking and you say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. So Jesus said, you guys don't, you ever feel like no matter what you do, you're wrong? Like when your wife says, does this dress make my butt look big? (laughs) There's no good answer. There's no right answer. You're done. You're toast. (laughs) Say, well, it's, it's not the dress, dear. Or you say, you know, like, well, no matter what you say, no matter what you say, it's, it's, it's no good. And he's saying, listen, John the Baptist came as a witness to you guys, and he was austere. He cut himself off from the world. He ate bugs dipped in honey, okay? He was, he was keto all the way. And Jesus comes, and he spends time with these sinners, Because it's the sick that need a doctor, Jesus says. And he goes there to make a difference. 
and they reject his message. They reject it when they get it from an austere guy who doesn't compromise in any way, shape, or form, and there's no one who would question his dietary or his dress, that he spent too much money on his camel hair or something. And Jesus was one of us. He came eating and drinking. He ate bread and he drank wine and they called him a drunkard. You're a drunkard and a compromiser because you hang out with all these sinners. I mean, we played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. It was like uh, Jesus was a little bit like a wedding. In fact, he calls himself the bridegroom and he calls the church the bride. In fact, the disciples didn't fast and they said, how come your disciples don't fast? Why John's, you know, John's fast. And he goes, yeah, they're not going to fast now because the bridegroom's with them. It's, it's time for a party. Jesus is on the earth giving salvation and teaching. It's not time to mourn. It's time to learn and time to rejoice. And he says, yeah, we mourn, but you didn't, uh, you, you didn't cry. You didn't, you didn't mourn. We're trying to give you a message and you don't respond no matter what end we're on. Whether we're on the austere, you know, solid, you know, religiously right, or whether we're on the more relational. You don't respond to either one. I always think of the bagpipes when I think of mourning at a, uh, at a funeral. I don't know why. Maybe it's my Irish blood. But it seems that no matter what you do or how you speak to some people, they will be offended. Did you realize that? That's when you go, I'm done. I'm done trying to talk to you. I'm done trying to share the gospel with you. I'm done being patient with you. I'm done talking to you. I'm done telling you anything personal about me because anything I say can and will be used against me. Right? And Jesus says, what do I like these people? You know, I, we sing you a song to, to, to get you to dance and you don't move. You got a sour face on. And then we sing a dirge and you won't mourn. It's like you're completely immovable. Your heart is so hard that, that you're, you're not able to be moved by anything. That's a, that's a terrible condemnation of mankind. And that's what happens when people get involved in this world and they get involved in sin. You become very calcitrant and your heart becomes hard and you defend yourself because by golly, I will never be hurt again. Not you good people, but there are people like that. And so John's in prison wondering when he's going to escape and he doesn't. The next passage is right on the heels of this. And then one of the Pharisees, as he's undoubtedly probably in the city of Nain where he raised this boy, one of the Pharisees asked, Pharisees asked to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and he sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now, I don't know if you've ever had this happen. I imagine not, because we don't do this. But Jesus has come into town. One of the Pharisees, one of the religious rulers says, I want you to come to my house for food. And Jesus goes everywhere where there's food. <laughs> he does. What's he say in Revelation? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone comes and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them. The, all the post appearances of Jesus Christ uh, involve food. He shows up with the disciples. He says, peace be with you. He says, you got some fish? <laughs> yeah, I, every, he's, he's, on the road to, he's on the road to Damascus and there's a couple of disciples. He, he gives them a Bible study on the way there. It gets dark and he walks on like he's going to continue on. And they say, no, 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 you need to come in. You can't keep walking on. I imagine, you, you know, Jesus has a hoodie on and they don't see his face. And he's different because he's resurrected now. And they welcome him in and they put him in the seat of prominence because he's a guest. And they probably ask him to pray to the Shema and to break the bread. And as he's breaking the bread, they recognize him and he disappears. Food. 
And there's going to be a big wedding banquet, by the way. So, Jesus is all about food. The Pharisee, he, he, he found Nicodemus in the tree, and he goes, you need to come down because I'm eating lunch at your house. <laughs> food. You wonder why it is that we have food after every service. It's biblical. <laughs> and he's in this Pharisee's house, and it was the custom, if you had somebody who was of prominence who came over your house, these folks don't have screens. They don't have windows. Everything's wide open. You would have people from the city that would gather around and hang by the windows, hang on the wall, and listen, especially if he was teaching. And so you have all of these people gathering, and here's a woman who's probably got a reputation as a prostitute. It's the only way that she could be identified as a sinner because most sins are private unless you stand on a corner and advertise. And this woman sneaks in to this Pharisee's house. Now that would be forbidden. And she comes and plants herself at the feet of Jesus and weeps, cries. I don't know if you've known anybody that's had that kind of a lifestyle. They're usually hardened. They don't cry for anybody. You can't hurt me bad enough to make me cry. And she's weeping and weeping. And I'm not sure she planned on this because she's weeping on, at his feet, which is a place of humility. And she's gushing to the point where she's getting his feet wet. And she's like, oh my goodness, I'm getting his feet wet. And now she's got no towel, so she uses her hair which is a symbol of beauty for a woman. It's a covering for a woman. It's a, it's a sign of her glory. And here she is wiping, because I'm sorry, Lord, I cried on your feet, and wiping his feet with her hair, which isn't what hair's for. And she has brought this alabaster flask. By the way, this alabaster flask is about this big. It's made out of stone and carved out of solid stone, and it usually has a little stopper in it, and it's sealed. It's usually given to a woman as a dowry. So if you see a girl with like a, like a big bottle, you, you know you're, you're coming into an inheritance if you marry her. That's essentially what it was. Probably given to her by her dad or by her family years ago when she was a little girl. It's probably the only valuable thing that she has left because she's given away everything else for a price. And it's probably got thousands of memories attached to it. Maybe the one pure thing that she has left in her life. And she cracks this thing open and she pours it on his feet. The most important thing, the most valuable thing to her. This is not Mary. By the way, there's another incident when this happens, but he also gets it on his head, and that's a completely different thing. And the other Gospels record that. Only Luke records this one. It's a sinful woman. By the way, that would be any woman, right? But when this term is being used, it means that she's living a lifestyle of sin. For her to come and weep on his feet, dry them with her hair, and then pour this ointment is just an amazing thing. And you can imagine the room full of people that are eating. Now, they don't have chairs like we did. They're kind of, you know, out on one elbow at a triclinium, and they would be on pillows at the table, more like a coffee table height, and they'd be eating as they're kind of laying there. So his feet are behind him. So this woman drops behind him, behind Jesus, as all this is happening in the, in the house. And this is a very sensual very private. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I get a little conscious when I kiss my wife publicly, you know, a public display of affection. This is a public display of affection that was beyond uncomfortable for everyone in the room. And so you've got the Pharisee going, what in the stinking world is going on here in my house? Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. By the way, 
There were Pharisees that had nothing to do with people who were known sinners. They would stay away, had to be an arm's distance away like somebody had leprosy or something. If they were suspicious, if they didn't like the way you looked, they would stand at, you know, stay away from me. And this is long before COVID. <laughs> and Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. Now, all this is going on, but nobody's saying anything. Jesus isn't speaking to the woman. The Pharisee's not talking to Jesus. They're all just kind of like, could you pass the corn? <laughs> it's uncomfortable. And Jesus says, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. When they had nothing in which to repay, he freely forgave both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. In the middle of this uncomfortable thing, Jesus says, I've got a, I've got a parable for you. A parable is something where you, you come alongside and he's going to teach a truth that kind of comes alongside. And he says, there's these two debtors. One owes a tremendous amount of money, like 50 grand. And the other one only owes 5,000. And th the guy calls him up and he says, listen, I got to settle accounts. And he forgives them both. And Jesus says, who will love him more? The question is, how much do you love Jesus? Because if you and I and everyone else that know him has been forgiven of their sins, who's going to love him more? The one who had more sin. Amen. The question is, do you see your sin? Amen. You see, this, this Pharisee was just the biggest sinner as this woman was in different ways, in more socially acceptable ways, but exactly the same. And he didn't see himself as a sinner or he wouldn't call her one. He saw himself as above it all, better than her. So he says, well, Jesus, I guess. You see, this, this guy doesn't want to answer the question because he understands. He's not an idiot. Jesus is pointing the finger at these two people and saying, who's going to love more, the one that was forgiven more or the one that was forgiven less? And he goes, well, I suppose the one that was forgiven more. Yeah. You, bingo. Yahtzee, you got it. Even there, he's reluctant to give Jesus an answer, which tells you a condition of his heart, right? I find sometimes I'm the woman weeping at Jesus' feet, knowing I'm unworthy, say, I'm nothing without you. And then there are times when I'm like Simon, when I can look at other people and judge them less. I can be a fault finder. I pick up my guitar and I know exactly which string is not in tune because I, I pick that stuff up. And it's a heck of a thing to live with. And we can be that way with one another. I just see the one little thing that's out of tune in your life. How is that? So Jesus says, who do you think is going to love him more? And it sounds a lot like the parable that Jesus told in Matthew 18. He said, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. By the way, a talent is a year's wage. So it's 10,000 years wages. It's way bigger than your mortgage. But he was not able to pay. His master commanded that he be sold, his wife and his children, and all that he had, that payment could be made. By the way, this is what they did back then. The servant, therefore, fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me. I will pay you all, which is ridiculous. Because if he lived 10,000 lifetimes and he got every penny, then he'd get paid off. But that ain't going to happen, right? And the master of that servant was moved with compassion and released him and forgave the debt, not even an IOU. But that servant went out 
then found one of his fellow servants who'd owed him a hundred denarii, probably got him a coffee at Starbucks. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. But he would not. But he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. You don't, you don't get debt paid when you're in prison. So his fellow servants saw all that had been done. They were very grieved. And they came and told their servant all that had been done. And then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. By the way, you don't make any money being tortured either. Jesus says this, verse 35, so my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you does from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. That's a pretty hard smack on the wrist, isn't it? Because I tend to hold on to things, hold things against people. That's my sinful nature. And unless I always have a picture of how much grace I need, I won't be very gracious to you. If I don't see myself as a sinner in need of salvation, then I won't have any grace on you. And yet, in the Lord's Prayer, we're told to pray that, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive me, Lord, the way I forgive everyone else. Does that not make you uncomfortable? Lord, I want you to forgive me according to your loving kindness, not mine. That's an indictment, isn't it? You can't pray that prayer unless you've given everything over. You say, all right, Lord, I'm, pff, I'm even going to pre-forgive everyone. I'm going to forgive everybody in advance. So maybe I'll get some of that. And then he turned to the woman. Jesus finally is going to pay attention to what's happening at his feet. Until now, he hasn't. Not a word. As though, nothing to see here. Then he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? Did he see the woman? He saw a sinner. He didn't see a person. He didn't see a woman who was broken. He didn't, somebody, he didn't see somebody repentant. He didn't see somebody in need. He was not motivated at all to see her as a human being. He says, do you see this woman? He doesn't. Simon doesn't see her. I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. He did not anoint my head, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. What a slap in his face. The reason that you don't have a response, Simon, is because you don't see yourself as a sinner and you don't see this person as a person. We need to see people for who they really are. Jesus saw the potential of this woman and he saw a repentant heart. What he saw in Simon was a calcified heart who had no compassion at all for the woman who's entered his house. I was wondering if he was getting ready to have the servants throw her out. Do you see people like Jesus sees people? Sometimes I see people that are high maintenance. Do you know what I mean? High maintenance? Yeah. Oh, there's so-and-so. Yeah, it's Sunday morning and I know 
They say, hey, listen, can I take a minute of your time? And you go, don't lie to me already. <laughs> this is going to be an hour, right? You're going to need an hour of my time. But then I'm seeing people like Simon does. Or do I see people the way Jesus sees people? Do you see this woman? Do you see that she has needs? And do you see the evidence of God's grace in her heart? Because she's crying her eyes out. She's wiping my feet down with her hair. She's doing a much better job than you, Simon. She took care of me being here. You haven't showed the least bit of hospitality because he didn't see himself as a sinner. I think our worship has everything to do with how we see Jesus and how we see ourselves. Do I see myself as being this close to the edge of hell because that's what I deserve? And yet Jesus has snatched me up from the brink of that and he has set me on a throne and he has called me his child just like he has you. Do you see this woman? We should see people as Jesus sees people. Proverbs 20 verse 6 says, Most men will proclaim each his own goodness, but who can find a faithful man? It's easy to find people patting themselves on the back, patting their resume, saying all sorts of good things about themselves. Hey, how was your weekend? Oh, it was awesome. My life is awesome. You should have my life. Everything is good. I don't struggle with anything and I'm sinless. Ding. You know, there's, there's a million people like that. But to find a faithful person, a person who's honest and says, you know what, honestly, I'm not doing so good. Because we don't want to show people that little soft underbelly of ourselves. I'm really struggling with something. Something ha somebody hurt my feelings and I'm really struggling with forgiving them. How refreshing it is to hear that. You know why? Because then it gets dealt with and it gets washed off. And the Spirit of God could come as an anointing and, and wash over that. And when you share those burdens with other people, don't, don't share them with, you know, don't share them with people that don't have strong backs, that won't be able to carry it with you to Jesus. What are you telling me for? That's what Simon would do. 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. I think being a student of the Bible, I think being a follower of Jesus Christ means that the Spirit of God comes and makes you a new creature and you begin to look past the outside and you start to look to the heart of a person. Even the most angry person, the most difficult person, there's a reason for that and maybe the Lord has put them in your path for you to make a difference in their life. Maybe Jesus wants to use you as an instrument And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man that even forgives sins? And then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And you know, that's what saves any of us, is putting faith in the word of Jesus Christ. It's not by what you do. It's not how perfect you live. It's not how much you give. It's not what a kind, compassionate person you are. It's not how hard you work. None of those things impresses God. Who gave you all the ability to do that anyway? What he wants us to do is believe him, put faith in him, trust him. And she did. And he says, your sins are forgiven. And it's evidenced by our humility. Simon's going to walk away from this with nothing more than a full belly. It says in Romans 3, 23 and 24, for all have sinned. That means all. And fall short 
of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus came and died for our sins. That is the bare bones of what Christianity is. And anybody telling you something different is probably trying to get to your money. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You and I alike, Christians should be different because God is working on them and they're a construction. Not that they're perfected already, but as far as God's concerned, it's a done deal. But there's still a lot of work to be done in me. And I imagine there's a lot of work to be done in you. So how could I hold anything against any one of you for falling short of the glory of God? Because we all do. In Romans 6, 23 carries it on for the wages of sin. In other words, what we earn when we act out our sinful nature is death not just physical death, but spiritual death. There's two deaths. There's a physical death when your spirit leaves the body, and then there's eternity, where your spirit leaves the presence of God and goes into a place called hell. There are two deaths. Unless you're born again, and then you'll only have one death. So if you're born twice, you only die once. But if you're only born once, you're going to die twice. You'll be separated from the body and separated from the presence of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that's it. You guys have been a great audience and very quiet. I trust that the Lord is speaking to your heart and I trust that he might help you to consolidate that before you leave here because the tendency is that you'll get up and walk outside and forget all about what happened here. We're not unaware of his schemes. You might be in a place like John the Baptist where you're in a place and you're wondering where God is. Where's my savior? Where's my miracle? And not understanding that the Lord has a plan. Or you might be in a place where you have a knowledge of your utter and total sinfulness and how we were born in sin and we're going to have to die and leave this body and face the Lord. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ personally as your Lord and Savior, I would invite you to make the most important decision by believing what he says. And it's only through having faith in what he says that we're saved, much like the woman in our story. It is not by any sort of act of righteousness that you might do. It has to do with simply believing God's word. And when that happens, you become adopted into the family of God. If you haven't done that, you can do it right now. Let's pray. Father, every one of us is like the woman in the story where we have fallen short of your glory. I pray, Lord, that there are none of us that think we're good enough because there is no good enough. Only one was good enough, and that was you, Lord Jesus. If there are people here, Lord, within the sound of my voice that don't know you, I pray that they would do business with you like this woman did. That they would come and weep at your feet. That they would recognize who you are and that you are the one who forgives sins. Lord, help us to have known you, not to become like Simon, where we judge people on a curve. And we usually come out on top. Lord, help us to be humble and gentle and loving that we would be demonstrations of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.